Hello and good afternoon. Arrow, good afternoon to you. Good evening. Uh, it's three minutes till curfew here in Kiev, capital of Ukraine. Wow. So curfew is what, 10 o'clock or 11? Uh, in Kiev, it's different in every city. In Kiev, it's uh, 11 o'clock. I just saw a global newscaster feature you on his news program where you talk about going from Lviv and traveling by train across Ukraine. You've got some guts, dude. Where, where do you find the courage to do this? Because a lot of people would go the other direction. <laughs> well, you know, I just finished uh, uh, two weeks ago. I finished about a month long tour of many parts of Ukraine. Uh, down to uh, Odessa in the south, to Kharkiv, 30 miles from Russia, where there was a missile that hit um, just a few blocks from my hotel. Uh, and, and so I was pretty exhausted after that trip. Uh, I was reporting, we went on humanitarian missions as well, and uh, I, was, I was very tired, but uh, we have a, a Canadian a YouTuber that's visiting and, and you know, wants to see the country. And so I said, okay, I can't just rest in Lviv. You know, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, and so, yeah, but it does, I mean, you get used to it. In fact, uh, Arrow, today I was, I was speaking with this Canadian that was here, and anytime you talk with someone who's new here, you know, it's, it's hard to explain what the reality has been like. Uh, you just have to feel it. And uh, so my friend asked me, you know, if you're in a city that is really under attack, what, what do you do when there's an alarm? Like, do you, do you go in the shelter? I said, not anymore. I said, you know, and, and and I hadn't thought about this question. Um, it's not because you don't. It's not because you don't care. It's after you know because for three or four months, especially at the beginning of the war, every time there was an alarm, you were going to the shelter, and you realize you can't live like that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you never get sleep. And so, you just you 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 you, you, you able you adapt to it. Uh, it doesn't change the risk, but you you just you find a way to live with it. And and it's really amazing how humans can adapt. Uh, and so it's um yeah so, so you, yeah you do get an uneasy feeling. Uh, in fact, I have an uneasy feeling now because we have you know we, we keep hearing reports um, that the Russians have prepared a, a, a you know and for, for every week for the past th almost two and a half months, there's been a massive infrastructure attack on Ukraine. Tomorrow's Thursday. It's one hour until Thursday. This week has been so quiet. We have not had any major attacks. Uh, Except for the front lines with the, with the fighting that's happening on the ground and, and artillery shelling, we've not had any ma major attacks since Wednesday before Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and and t today is uh, tomorrow is the first of December, uh, so for for uh, for seven days, it's been so quiet with very few air alarms, which is nice, but it makes you feel very uneasy. Is it is it because the Russians are waiting for a fresh shipment of of, of weapons? You know, this is hard to know. I mean, you know, are, are they getting some weapons supplied from, from North Korea, from China, from Iran? It's possible, but according to a lot of open source intelligence, uh, as of, like, when I was taking the overnight train two days ago from Lviv to Kiev, uh, very comfortable train. The Ukrainian trains are amazing, by the way. They, they're almost always on time, even in the war. And uh, I'm, I'm, I have a full bed to myself. And uh, and so, I, but I wake up in the middle of the night in the train, and I'm looking at my phone, and I... Um, there's a lot of you know, people can look at open source intelligence and see that uh, Russian uh, air bases and military bases seem to be preparing something. Mm -hmm. uh, there are reports that maybe up to 160 missiles are already loaded up on planes. 160 would be twice as much as the worst attack we've had so far in one day. Uh, and and it, you know because Russia has been so unsuccessful on the ground, uh, Ukrainians have pushed back successfully. Uh, it seems their best tactic now is to hurt Ukrainian infrastructure as as the winter sets in. And, you know, it, winters are very cold here. I, I was going around the Kiev suburbs today in the snow. It's very it's freezing and cold and snowy. Um, and so it seems that Russia's uh, method now is, is to, you know, attack Ukraine's, uh, you know, heating and elect uh, electrical grid. Um, that's... And so we're facing the prospect of an extremely difficult uh, winter. Uh, and but, but still, pe people find I mean, Ukrainians are very resilient, and people find ways to carry on. But it's it's going to be a cold, dark winter. There's there's no other way to say it. Paint for me a photograph of the reality of the moment of now in the way that we can all see it as well as feel it. And I think that's one thing that we need to do is we need to start feeling the impact on the world 
and not just one certain area. I was in the suburbs of Kiev, which I think we've all seen, hopefully all seen the photos and images of Bucha and Irpin. Uh, these, these, these little cities just outside the city limits of Kiev, which the Russians controlled in, in, in the early weeks of the war, when the, when the tanks were right on the edge of, of the Ukrainian capital. And uh, I went to visit them today because, we, uh, you know, the, the famous uh, graffiti artist, the mysterious Banksy, he painted some, uh, some graffiti art and we wanted to go look at it. And in doing so, we met and talked with a lot of people. And so I'm standing amid these apartment blocks, like Soviet, uh, 12-story Soviet era apartment blocks. And some of these buildings on the side, there's no wall. Mm. So you, you can look and see into people's houses as they wore on February 24th, February 25th of this year. Everything frozen in time. I saw a bookshelf. I saw a kitchen table teetering on the edge, uh, eight stories up. And... And even though half of these buildings are destroyed, some people still live there. And there was a group of women. They were standing outside, uh, and and they were having they were having some schnapps and some uh, some pizza, uh, standing outside. And we started to talk to them, and they and the, they were caught by surprise in the first few days of the war. They had to go into shelter. They were hiding for five days, terrified that the Russians would find them. Fortunately, they were able to escape. Uh, one woman she escaped to Europe. She was a refugee, I think, in Germany. Uh, for for a few months, and she came back. Arrow, like she she was taken care of in Germany, and there's no war there. She still she came back uh, as soon as her town was liberated. Uh, she came back, and even though half of her building was destroyed, she she still lives in that building. Hmm. And she said, before the war, she said so many of us had dreams of moving to America, moving to Europe, and she said now no. She said, I only want to live in this country because it's the greatest country. Oh and so there, there's, there's this, and, and you look around us, you know, not only we're freezing and there's no heat, uh, but we're surrounded by bombed out buildings. And, uh, and, and to see, to, I mean, it, it, when she said that, uh, the girl who was one of our guides was crying. There, it was so cold, the tears were frozen on her face. Um, but it, it is, it, it's just an inspiring uh, viewpoint. And, and I think, when I talk with so many of the Americans who come here, uh, they say, I feel happier here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's because of the spirit. And so, yes, it's homelessness uh, technically, but, but, but there's a sense of home, a sense of belonging that is uh, ever more palpable. We had a guest at Harris Teeter the other day, and uh, he he was fresh from Ukraine, and he's a he's a U.S. soldier, and uh, and he's retired, but he he he's he's going back to Ukraine because he he's he's trying to help out. I just love stories like this that that you know they're there, but 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 it's requiring those that have left our U.S. military in order to 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 have that presence there. Yeah, well, I, I see. I have so this. I guess because I love your Harris Teeter story. So you're, this this guy was probably checking out a Harris Teeter, and <laughs> I, I, how, how did Ukraine come up? I mean, you, you have a way of getting you know, people to tell their stories. Well, we we were talking about Thanksgiving, and he looked at me, and he goes, "You don't know what th- being thankful is all about." And he and he goes, "I just got back from Ukraine," and I went, "Oh, you're right. I don't know what being thankful is all about." And and that's where it all starts, guy. Yeah, you know, and I think probably the way he said that, I don't think he probably meant to put you down. I think he was probably just desperate for someone to share the story. Yes, with absolutely. What, and he just wanted a way to connect because when you're when you're always, uh, you know, yeah, I hear that story from so many people that when they leave here for a while, no one can relate, and that's why they come back. And even look at like the actor Sean Penn, who's been here five times, and I think for something like that, and when people find here purpose and meaning because. You, you you realize that time is limited, which it is for all of us. Mm-hmm. But you know you very clearly see that here, and you see good and evil so clearly. Um, there there was a, a video I'll send to you of a uh, Ukrainian soldier, and he made it for his mother, and he said he was trying to tell his mom not to worry. He said, "Don't worry, I'm here with my friends. We're, we're together mm-hmm. uh, in the trenches," and he said, "You did not raise me for war." I was, you know, we were not raised to be fighters. You did not raise me for war, which is a great thing. You, but you raised me to be a man. And what that means is, you know, and I think it's very applicable to maybe our American context. Too often in America, we are so, so argumentative, so angry. We're kind of raised for fighting and arguing. Uh, and and what this guy said, you know, we, we were not raised 
we were raised for peace. We were raised for a gentle life, like with family in the village. Uh, and but through that, if you know, you know, if, if you're raised with good values, no matter what challenge comes your way, you will fight for it. And and, uh, and I think if you have this, the that's why I see such uh, joyful spirit. I'm, I mean, I have a a friend who uh, a few weeks ago lost his leg mm. uh, fighting for Ukraine. Uh, because the Russians uh, blew it off. And before the war, he was working for a startup. He was never a warrior. Um, and, and you know, you, it's, it's a, you can look at it as a, as a shame, but he, his spirits haven't changed at all. And, uh, and, and sort of complete acceptance of it, and, and even uh, a defiance. And, and I would say that the Ukrainians have this, and everyone here, the Americans, all the foreigners that come here, they have this, uh, for the most part, this... Uh, cheerful, cheerful defiance, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and a lot of the Americans, and maybe you saw this with with the the, the veteran you met at the at Harris Theater, with a, especially with a lot of the Americans that come here, they come here a little bit broken, a little bit angry with the way things have been, especially from the military, and they're searching for some deeper purpose. Yep. 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 You uh, you have to somehow some way you've got to get your hands on this past week CBS Sunday Morning where they where they were uh, uh, they did a feature on the Ukrainian uh, soldiers where they they've given them you know uh, like new legs new arms and and that there's a big push for this to happen and that they still have that that urge to fight but they've got to get their bodies back in action first. Yeah, you know I I, I need to find it because I went uh, last in the summer to the main uh, prosthetic hospital. Uh, in in uh, Dnipro, in the east of Ukraine, and it was difficult to see it because not only they're making prosthetics for soldiers, but also for children. That's right. You know, like the tiny little feet and legs uh, for children who, uh, have been, you know, maimed in this. And uh, you know, they have they've created this amazing hospital train that runs from the east uh, to the west uh, several times a week uh, to, to 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 try to, to save these people's lives. And yeah, and they they find a way to. Um, it's uh, when when I've gone to difficult situations uh, near, at the front lines, uh, it's a common question. Sometimes people say it sort of jokingly, like, "Is it better to 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 get killed or to lose a limb?" Mm. <laughs> this is unfortunately a conversation you have as you're going to these places, and but now as I've seen, especially now knowing people who've lost, you know, a limb. It's much better to be alive, mm-hmm. and and but and, and this is where we see the difference of the only way Ukraine wins, and the reason why Ukraine is winning, is and I think the reason why Putin hates Ukraine, it, Ukraine has a victory mentality. There's no victimhood, not for a second. Like everyone, so, yeah, everyone has dark nights, and 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 people help each other with that, but there's no victim mentality. So R- R- Russia is a nation of victims. They're like. Just like the Germans were, they were a nation of victims in the 1930s. They're like, oh, everything's terrible. We have to blame someone. Mm. They blame the Jewish people and, and others. And, and the Russians have a victim mentality. They, they're not happy with their lives. They don't have a free, happy society. And they have to blame someone. And so they blame, in this case, Ukraine, or they blame NATO. But um, even with this horrible war, even with all the carnage I've seen all around the country, um, yeah, Ukrainians hate the Russians. But the... But the, but they don't they, they don't go around complaining. They they say we're gonna fight, we're gonna win, we're gonna achieve, um, and that's that's a big difference. Not complaining, and and, and, and even and I think maybe the essence to to have that mentality is maintaining the sense of humor, being able to laugh even in the face of the <laughs> the worst. Poor things. So, how did you react when when word got back to you about how Putin is uh, sitting down with the mothers of military men and women? I mean, it, and you know, it, it it seems like a propaganda move. Yeah, anything that comes out of the the Kremlin, I, I don't I don't trust. You know, I I, I I I I try not even to think about it because Putin and the Kremlin. I mean, there's a lot of great chess players there, and so they're they're trying to tug at different strings and. Uh, so I, I don't even put stock in that. And you know, Putin has two primary propaganda tracks, uh, especially when it comes to Americans. Uh, he he knows he, he's trying to convince some Americans that Ukraine is actually what Russia really is. So that Ukraine is some kind of corrupt, disgusting, 
uh, you know, uh, um, how do you put it, like a uh, uh, decadent, mm-hmm. uh, collapsed society, which is exactly what Russia is. Russia is like, th- th- there's Putin, there's the government, and there's nothing else. People don't have anything else to live for. Whereas Ukraine is a place of, you know, family and church and culture. Um, and But Putin's trying to convince Americans that, uh, that what his country is is what Ukraine is. And then his other propaganda approach for those who do believe in Ukraine and those who support Ukraine, he's trying to scare them with the nuclear fears. And, and, and these are very effective. I mean, I, I do see this working quite well in the States. Uh, but when he spoke with the mothers, um, I, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to know. I mean, with the actors are real, it's hard to know. But uh, I, it's, it's, it's nonsense because mm. why... To, tomorrow, I'm going to be with uh, with a 12 year old from Ukraine who escaped really? Ukraine, and she's in Ireland now. And she has a, a book. Her name I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, her name I'm going to I'm not going to get it right, and not until I talk to her tomorrow. Yeva Skalalaska, and the name of the book is "You Don't Know What War Is and What It Is." It's her journal. It's wow. her, oh, she this, went when this. she went into the basement when the when the country came under attack. The, the, we're going to start seeing a lot more of this, aren't we, Joe? Where where the, the the people of Ukraine have got to get the real, authentic photograph out here, just like you do. Yeah, and, and you know this is it's a very artistic and creative society, especially since the revolution of 2014, when they freed themselves uh, from from Putin's control uh, for these past eight years. And so Ukrainian Ukrainians are poetic people. And uh, and so I think that they are, that we will we, we're we're necessarily going to see a lot of uh, amazing stories come out of this. Uh, and that uh, when you interview her before that, I'll send you. There's a new song released by Irish musician Glenn Hansard. Mm-hmm. Uh, he made the movie once. Uh, it's called Take Heart, and it's in honor of Ukraine. And uh, uh, I'll send it to you before you before you speak with us. Please and, do. He was Please do. It inspired yeah. by the uh, Ukrainian refugees in Ireland. Well, you know, you, you use the word refugee, and one of the things, I, I got a note from them today, and, and they go, just an insight, and, and they go, um, you, you, you can use the word refugee, but just know that it bothers us deeply. And, and they said, but you can ask us why it bothers us deeply. So, so what, what have you heard on the streets in Ukraine? Why is the word refugee such a negative? Well, I, well it's exactly why, like in the story I told you uh, from the woman in, in the city of Bo- Bo- uh, Borodansk, uh, just outside of Kiev, she... She left Ukraine for, you know, April and May when, when her city was being, you know, when the Russians were controlling her city. But she didn't want to stay in, in Germany. You know, she wasn't like, and because I think there's a perception, especially in Europe, um, a lot of refugees, you know, leave their country. Like if you, you leave Syria or you leave Afghanistan, never wanting to go back because the country is so terrible. And Ukrainians say their country is different. They, their country is you know, Ukrainians are united. They built a, I mean, they have differences, but they've, they've built a country that they like to live in and, and they want to go home. They don't want to be permanent refugees. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's why they don't like that word. I mean, they're, they're temporarily displaced, but they don't, I mean, they're not looking to like take benefits and stick around forever in, in other countries. Um, in fact, a lot of them say, and I've heard, several friends have told me that they, they had, everyone has complaints about where you live, and there's plenty of problems that were here. And so they were complaining always about Ukraine. But then when they went to go live in France or Germany or other countries, they said, oh, this, this, is, this is a lifestyle not suited for us. We miss our country. We want to go home. What is it like on your side? Let's flip flop a little bit here in the way that what do Ukrainians as well as Americans in Ukraine see when you keep hearing about these mass shootings in America? And now, and now there are travel agencies that are saying, don't go to America. Well, you know, it's, uh, for example, uh, today I was traveling through devastated, um, devastated suburbs of Kiev. And, and even though it's freezing cold and there's snow coming down, I can hear hammers in the distance. People are rebuilding uh, now that now that the cities are, uh, you know, the Russians are gone from those cities. And but as I looked around me, I felt at times that I was in a like Baltimore because mm-hmm. some of the worst neighborhoods in Baltimore completely collapsed. And but you, what you don't hear in those neighborhoods is the hammer. You don't hear the rebuilding. And uh, I've I think it's 
it's hard for Ukrainians really to realize this. They still look at America as sort of the promised land. Uh, uh, they did before the war, at least. But for so many of the Americans to come here, they're, 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 they're tired of all that. They, they recognize that there's a problem with our culture um, that makes us so violent, and not just by shooting each other, but by always, you know, attacking each other. And um, it's uh, and that's why so many people come here seeking. They, they they come here and they find they're happier when they're here in a wartime. Uh, and you know, the streets of of like Kharkiv, 30 miles from Russia, as long as there's no air alarm are safer than walking most American cities. And there's not even street lights. So I, I can walk with confidence with no street lights through Ukraine's second biggest city. It has much less people now because of the war. But the, the, I'm not going to get robbed or nothing, nothing bad's going right. to happen. Right. And um, I wanted to do that in Chicago or New York, you know? So you don't look over your shoulder? No. No? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so this is the difference. We have a, here, there's a society of trust. And I think we have to, you know, analyze, uh, you know, America. I think the big problem in America is social isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's where you get the mass shootings. Every single, I think, I don't know, I think we can safely say every single mass shooter, uh, in a, they, okay, they could get guns easily, but also they, they had, they were isolated from society. Uh, you know, there wasn't a village mentality. And, uh, you know, they had crazy, you know, bad, um, situations growing up and uh uh and, and and how often are those people exposed to something true and good and beautiful and this is what we see i think so much with russian culture um it's 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 a it's a bleak culture so full of so much hateful rhetoric and uh uh that that's going to create hateful people mm -hmm. and, and this is where we go to victory mentality versus victim mentality if you're a victim and you keep being a victim and you let that overtake your mind, then the only thing you can do is to victimize someone else. Yep. But if you if you have a victory mentality, you want other people to come with you in the victory. It's it, you have a son of your disposition, and this this is the key is to to have a victory mentality and not a victim mentality. One of the most inspirational things that I pick up all the time from from Ukraine is that when the lights do go out, the candles come out, and then business it's business <laughs> as usual. Yeah, I mean, I, so I've seen that, uh, especially in Lviv. Uh, people in Lviv, uh, they, you know, it's a very medieval city, so they they like to they like to live that way anyway. And um, yeah, as cheerful as possible. And uh, I was talking with uh, clerks and all over the country in shops uh, when when they lose internet and power, they just they have a logbook and they keep IOUs, mm. and and they're confident that people will come back and pay. Uh, and uh, and it's it's it's, it's inspiring. And it's amazing. Uh, in a country this big, too, you know, it's the largest country totally within Europe, but to have this widespread uh, trust and, and cheerfulness, um, it's a, it's a, again, it's a refusal to be a victim mm -hmm. and say, you know what, we're going to enjoy this. It looks better with candles. Who needs the electricity? In, in doing my research for Yeva t for tomorrow, the one one of the things that really opened up my eyes that, w that we've never really touched base on is that once the war began, nobody's talking about how expensive everything became. In, in America or everywhere. Right? Oh yeah, it, well in Ukraine, she she talks about that how how the price of food, the price of anything was 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 really starting to increase. Yeah, you know, I I, 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 had, I mean, and you, cause before February twenty fourth, uh, before the full scale invasion, Ukraine did not have the same inflation problems that you saw in America, like with the, the you know groceries and all that. Right. Um, it wasn't a problem. I think it's a lot of things were locally sourced. Um, but yeah, with the war, uh, it's it's become difficult. At first, it was very difficult to get a lot of supplies and things you had to import. It was hard to move things around the country. Uh, you also had a problem where uh, so many people left the east, and so they go to cities like Uzgorod and Lviv, and they get these cities get overwhelmed. So the rent goes up. Um, yeah, it was that was very difficult, and uh, uh, and 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 then couple that with a lot of people, you know, you lose your livelihood. Um, uh, it's hard to keep a business going, uh, you know, with the shorter hours, maybe your business was bombed. Uh, and even the Ukrainians, you know, who work in the IT companies, I mean, I go to any coffee shop in Kiev and it's filled with people on their laptops, you know, when they go into a place where they can get power running their IT business. But unfortunately, a lot of people, um, 
in the West and in America are afraid of hiring Ukrainians, uh, you know, because they're afraid, oh, it's war, maybe, you know, it's an unreliable uh, person to hire. But what they don't realize is probably the best person you can hire because they can't be lazy. They can't give up for one second. It's going to be the best, you know, the best contractor you could ever have um, because they have every motivation in the world to excel because they don't have they, they have no other opportunity. Joe, they're working here in the United States, and then they come to Harris Teeter, and they use Western Union to send that money back home. They, they, I, I've seen it. I see it every single week. Well, yeah, that's because that, that's where their heart is, and 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 that's uh, yeah, and, and I think for even all the Ukrainians who are outside of the country, uh, everyone is you know, there's so many different front lines, and it's you know, there's not really there's not just a front line of battle. It's it's everyone contributing to. Uh, uh, to to make victory possible, and and then I think what people not only in Ukraine but also especially in Poland and the Baltic countries, but also some other people around the world, this is not just about Ukraine because if Ukraine falls, Russia now controls, and you know I, 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 I this would never happen because Ukrainians would never surrender. There'd be an amazing resistance, but Russia would control the largest country totally within Europe. They would c- control. So many natural resources, semiconductor supply chain. Russia would be so powerful, they could take over more countries. Mm-hmm. And people, other people recognize it. So, so, so it's, and that's why it's not just Ukrainians supporting Ukraine. So people, you know, there's, I mean, we had a few months ago, there, I think in a, I forget what part of America, but uh, uh, there's a woman with five children and her children went out to their neighborhood and they raised enough money to buy one helmet for a Ukrainian soldier. And and so, you know, every little step like that is a fight of good versus evil, uh, uh, of the free world against the tyrannical world. Um, and, and, you know, and we see now, too, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you, s- you see what's happening in Iran and China. And, mm-hmm. um, the, you know, it's not just Ukraine. There, there, are, there are free people struggling, uh, f- you know, for, for, for their for their liberty and dignity all over the world right now. Joe, and, uh, the, the soccer the contain... soccer team is afraid of going home because they didn't sing the Iranian national anthem. They're horrified to go home. Yeah, and did you see that the when, when they lost, when Iran lost the United States, mm-hmm. people in Iran erupted into cheers. They were yep. so happy yep. that, that their country lost, and, and, and one guy honked his horn and the police shot him. Mm. Um, and so, and when I saw that, it reminds me of what happened in 2014 in Ukraine when the Ukrainians stood up to the pro-Putin regime and the secret police shot them. And usually when the police start shooting, the people go home. But in Ukraine, they didn't. And that's why this war is happening, because they refused to go home. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so there's a high price, and we see this now happening in Iran. We'll see what the Chinese people are able to, to do. But uh, it's unfortunate. I mean, <laughs> why does it have to... Why, why, does some, why can't people... Uh, those... In, why do we have to have people in power who are so afraid of freedom? Yeah. Tomorrow, another one of my guests is is going to be Bill O'Reilly. And one of the questions that I want to do is that Bill is known for doing a lot of books on history and about, mm-hmm. about political leaders and stuff like that. I, I'm going to physically have the courage to ask him, what about a book of history moving forward? How about a Bill O'Reilly book about Z- Zelensky? Yeah, ask him. And I'm curious because a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, I mean, Bill was a former colleague of mine, um, and uh, I don't know if you could ask if he remembers me or not. I'll do but, it. Uh, I'll do it. What's we, he? What's he going to well, tell me? What's he going to tell me? Well, I, you know, actually, I, I mean, he's. I think he's. He's. He's much freer now after, especially since he left Fox News. He's got his, you know, his own media apparatus, and he's a free guy. And we used to go to Yankee games with oh Roger Ailes, God. and um, so yeah, I mean, I ask him and actually tell him. If you don't mind, then yeah, that I'm in Ukraine reporting here because I and I was having this conversation today. Um, for some reason, so many of the Americans who talk about freedom, like Tucker Carlson, who kind of took over Bill's slots at Fox, they don't they don't like Ukraine. But if they if they really paid attention, they would see that this these are the these are the freest people in the world. Ukrainians, um, I mean even. Even in wartime, they argue, they, they talk about the government. Uh, they're, 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 they are, they can't be controlled. And uh, so people, I, I, think Bill, I think Bill would appreciate that uh, about the Ukrainian people. 
And uh, so I hope you do ask him about Zelensky. I, I'm going to. Him. I'm going to because yeah. I, I, you know, you know, you know me. I'm always going to go and try to get the the conversation that nobody else got, and and I think that that's going to open up a door like you wouldn't believe. Well, I, yeah. So yeah, so tell him I said hello, and I haven't seen him since Yankee Stadium uh, when I was there with Roger Ailes. And uh, but uh, yeah, let him know that. Uh, yeah, tell him I said hello from Ukraine. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, I'm very curious to know. I mean, I, I think that he would stand with Ukraine. I, I, I don't know. I, um, so I, I'm curious. I'm going to have to. I can't wait to listen to that episode. Absolutely. All right. Now, so where can people uh, uh, support you and give you guys a lot of love over there? Because I know you've got a website where people can donate money. Yeah. If you go to ukrainianfreedomnews.com, uh, you can find our uh, videos and, and stories. Uh, and, and we welcome, yeah, any donations are welcome to keep our media. Uh, it's all volunteer. Our media operations going, and uh, and then whenever we hear of urgent needs uh, for soldiers and hospitals, uh, we do everything we can to to get them what they need. So UkrainianFreedomNews.com. All right, man, we got to do this again, over and over and over again, until you get back home to your mom and dad. I know, Aaron. Sorry, I was absent. I mean, it was the past. The, I don't know. I think I need a break the past week. But, I get uh, it. I get it, man. Uh, we, we've been in this weird time with no alarms, and it, it plays tricks with your mind. So, but so I'm, I'm glad we talked today. Well, we're always thinking about you, dude. Okay, thank you, Errol. Right. I would look forward to talk, talk, talk to you soon.